Hello, Paper and Glam reading family. Welcome to June's installment of the Paper and Glam book club. I am so excited to discuss our June read, which is Taylor Jenkins' read, One True Loves. So I added this to our book club lineup for 2020 because A, it's the perfect like rom-com for the summer when we all might need a little escapist read. And also it was recommended by the American reading queen, Miss Ann Vogel, as being serious Gatsby vibes. So that's what we're up to this evening. As you guys, my beautiful readers probably know, and if you're just joining us, welcome. I'm Lisa Marie and welcome to the Paper and Glam Book Club. We have been reading a book a month together since September of 2014. So I love that this has been such a beautiful and consistent place where we can all meet together as like-minded women and readers to discuss the reading life. And I also want to thank all of you who support the Paper and Glam Book Club on Patreon. You can support us right down below and join us for a members-only live stream once a month where we discuss books and reading in general. We're doing spreadsheet school this next coming Patreon live stream, which is always the Thursday before a book club. And so it's the usually the third Thursday, but we meet the last Thursday of every month here for Paper and Glam Book Club. And the Thursday before is always Patreon live stream. So we have some pretty awesome TBR spreadsheets in the house. Our Paper and Glam librarian, Miss Anna, schooled us on spreadsheets on the last Patreon live stream. So we're going to continue in that theme in July, and I hope you can join us. So with that, let's get settled in and get started. So our icebreaker for this evening is what, oh, excuse me, what is one of your favorite literary love triangles? So the love triangle is a literary device of you know ancient ancient roots and it's what one true loves very heavily depends on so i i don't know i'm gonna give myself a minute to think about this one i'm not a huge fan of the love triangles trope um just because it always just feels like i don't know like an awkward episode of the bachelor and i just care about everyone's feelings so much <laughs> i can't think of anyone off the top of my head what what do you think miss anna I also kind of hate the literary love triangle trope. It's such a pain, but also it's what kind of keeps you invested overall. Um, I think my favorite one is actually from a manga series called Fruits Basket. Um, I actually had to remember that it was actually a love triangle because I'm so invested in one character in particular that I always forget that it's technically a love triangle between Toru Honda, Yuki Soma, and Kyo Soma, um, a set of cousins. And I just love it. And my favorite pairing kind of ends up at the end, but I don't want to spill anything. So, and it's also, they finally got the adaptation that it deserved um, over on Crunchyroll last year. So go check that out. <laughs> yeah, I think my, uh, uh, I'm, I'm similar. I, I'm not a big fan of uh, love triangles, um, except maybe on TV shows. It's more of a guilty pleasure than a, than a true love. Um, but if I had to choose a literary one, I guess I'd go with uh, Les Miserables, um, Cosette and Marius and Eponine. Um, but that's probably more from the musical, if I'm being really honest with myself. I've never actually read the book, but I love the musical. So that's it. Where do you do? Yeah, this was hard for me. I don't even think I really came up with the answer because it just tears it tears me apart um, to have uh, someone choose. Um, so, yeah, I couldn't um, I couldn't really answer this. The only thing I could think of was um, I read the Suki Stackhouse series um, before True Blood um, came about, and um, I guess her. Well, I guess she had real, a whole bunch of different love love interests <laughs> at one point um but between her and bill um and eric um the other vampire and then the rare rule um um alcide and then later she develops she starts talking or dating seeing a tiger named quinn um <laughs> so that was probably like the only one i really um enjoy but yeah i'm not the um biggest fan um 
Yeah, I don't like, especially in YA books, like you're like, I see the love triangle coming. Does this have to happen? Because I think, um, I don't know, I had like a, like one of my good friends in her life though, like she was that girl that everyone liked. And so I would say she had like seven boys at any given time who would all be friends and they didn't care. Like they were like, if I get my shot, I'm going to go for it. Like, <laughs> like, um, but so I, I don't know. I think that the real life practice of it, like, is so irritating to me that I don't like it in books. But my favorite one is going to be Midsummer Night's Dream. And so it's going to be um, because, you know, Helena and Hermia and you have Demetrius and Lysander. And I know it's like really four people, but, uh, you know, there's it's it really is a triangle in so far as like one likes the other likes the other. It's not two liking one, but it's literally like no one likes the same person. It goes like you could follow it with arrows in a triangle um, if you take, you know, one of the guys out. And so it's it's just. I like that, that it looks legitimately like a triangle if you draw it on, you know, rather than like just two arrows pointing up toward a girl. Typically, it's always a girl. Why is there rarely like a boy who's the center of the love triangle and he's picking between two girls? Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not a big fan of the love triangle either. Um, like Jana was saying, you can usually see it coming and a lot of times it's like the only like it, you can tell that it's only there to be dramatic and um so like you know how it's going to end um so I don't really have a good answer for this other than I thought this book did a good job with it um but I don't know that I really have one um I couldn't think of any that I was like oh yeah that one was really good forgot to unmute. Um, so librarian Anna made a really good point in the comments. She said she thought everyone would pick Bella, Jake, and Edward from Twilight. And that's such a good point. We as a big Paper and Glam book club Patreon community are currently rereading Twilight together and then watching the movies. So if you'd like to join us for that, we'd love that. Just link down below. And we're actually watching the movies live together on Zoom, which is such so emblematic of the world we're currently living in and it's been really fun to revisit these books and these characters together i do totally agree with anna that's a love triangle i could get down with but i think it's because i knew that of course she was going to pick edward so it almost made the love triangle bearable but yes um they're always just kind of painful to read for me i'm such a softy all right so now we're going to get to our typical intro question which is what was your experience reading one true loves and how many rings would you rate it i am moderating this month only if you guys have been following along with kind of the COVID paper and glam life. I went from a team of six to one, so I've been glamming so hard on one order and one email at a time and haven't gotten much reading done lately. So um, I'm really excited to hear what you guys think about it. And I will definitely be going back in and reading this book. It's one I've really been looking forward to just because of all the Gatsby vibes. So if you saw Gatsby vibes in the book, um, Jaina, I know you're a huge Gatsby fan and we actually read Gatsby together in September of 2017, I think, or maybe it was 18. Um, so you can go back and read that uh, with us if you wanna see kind of like previous books we've read together. We've read some really great ones. So uh, with that, Anna, what did you think of One True Loves? Uh, Lisa Marie and Jana might kill me for this, but I actually have never read Gatsby. So I have no idea if the that description is true. Um, but I rated it uh, three rings. I thought it was a very a solid kind of beachy read, even though I, f I personally probably would have picked this up more in like the winter, like near the holidays when it's like you don't really have time for a big thick novel. You just want something to kind of relax with. Um, I actually picked it up at 4 a.m. because I couldn't sleep and finished it by 8. <laughs> um, I didn't find myself too attached to the characters, but there were a lot of scenes and kind of emotional attachment to the events that were happening that really gutted me. So for that, I got a solid three stars for me. Um, 
yeah, so this has been my theme throughout the pandemic. I did not finish the book, but I'm here anyway. <laughs> I'm going to try my best to get through. Um, so, so far, I'm, it's fine, but I would say I'm probably just at a two or three. Um, I, I don't get Gat Gatsby vibes from it, but um, I would say more uh, to all the boys I've loved before vibes I'm getting from it so far. Um, but uh, that's mainly because it's like uh, YA, I think, or, or feels like it's in that wheelhouse. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's good. And, um, it, it may be a contradiction in that I'm like, it's only so, so, but it's been the first thing that's actually held my attention for a while. So that I know that's kind of a contradiction, but I think it's just cause it's kind of light and, um, I've been listening to it in the car and I feel like I'm actually going to be able to get through a book again, which I'm very excited about. <laughs> Over to you, Dee. Okay, I gave this uh, three stars. I didn't think it was awful, but I didn't love it. So I was right in the middle. I've read, um, and granted, I shouldn't have done this, but I was comparing her work to The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo and um, Daisy Jones and The Six, which are so good. Evelyn Hugo, like, so good. So, I don't know, this came out way before she did those, so um, definitely see the growth, so that's good. Uh, but yeah, I just um, didn't hate it, but I didn't love it. It was just average, good, good feel, good vibes. Yeah, right in the middle. Yeah, the same. I gave it a three. Also, um, it's not like my favorite books aren't contemporary romance so they usually like get a three they are what I expect and they give you what I want um I didn't know it was supposed to be Gatsby vibes but saying that I am guessing it's because there is a love who is lost and he returns complicating the new love that she's committed to beyond that I don't see it because even the new love she's committed to is not a complete jerk like Tom. So like, he's a great guy. He's a totally amazing guy. So then you don't know as a reader who to pick from because they're both amazing guys. Yeah. Um, I didn't see really any Gatsby vibes in it myself. Um, I, I read this when it originally came out and I absolutely loved it. I don't know if it was just the right time for me to read it. Um, but I think I maybe, I don't know for sure. I maybe gave it five stars when I read it the original time. Um, I wouldn't rate it quite that high this time. It would be like four, four and a half for me. Um, but I do think that it probably is in, I don't know that it's one of my absolute favorites, but it is a book that like I own because I want to be able to go back through it because like, I just like the depth and character and the details that she gives them, um, like her relationship with her family, um, and like uh, just a lot of the different stuff. Um, I guess, like I've said before, like I get really like, uh, emotionally invested like I feel the same thing that is like the character is feeling and so like this book was really um, impactful in that way and so I think that's why it's such a memorable book for me because it was one of those books where like I can remember exactly like where I was sitting when I read a certain scene and all of that stuff um, so I I really enjoyed it I I enjoy her writing I've uh, read all of her books and um, I think the thing that I liked about them is that even if I don't necessarily agree with what the characters are doing, like she writes it in a way that I understand it. So, um, I think that was what struck me the most when I read it the first time. All right. I love it. I feel you miss Maureen in that it's tough to finish books right now. We've been talking about on the Patreon live stream, how, Focus is really at a premium, especially if you're someone who uh, found yourself more busy during, you know, as a result of the, the COVID quarantine, just everything situation. If you found yourself more busy and then kind of were sorting through all of the other things happening in the 
world, it definitely has impacted um, our reading life. I, I personally have leaned in more to like reading about books and planning to read more so than actually digging into books. So if you're in that boat, know that you're, you're not alone. And um, I also really like what Erica said about one of the things I love about the reading life is that when I look at my bookshelves, it's like I remember where I was when I read each of those books and I remember certain scenes and like it just evokes that whole period of life. Something we talk a lot about on the God and Glam uh, community. We have a Patreon for God and Glam, the Paper and Glam Bible Study too, is the way that if if in your Enneagram you touch like the four number is you love atmospheric things and it's just like all about atmosphere. So one of the things that makes a book a really good book for me and like Jaina is atmosphere. So I, I just love that, that um, One True Loves kind of gave you enough atmosphere, Erica, to where you could like assign a memory to it. That's really cool. Okay, let's get into this book. Are you team Jesse or team Sam? Did you find yourself struggling to choose between the two alongside Emma. Take it away, Miss Anna. I am definitely Team Sam. Um, he's as selfless as he can be. He loves cats. He's steady. He's a homebody. Um, I don't think I struggled with picking one or him over Jesse, just because Sam is definitely more my type. If I have a type. Um, but I definitely could see why Emma was struggling and I struggled along with her because I wasn't sure who she wanted to be. Um, because when Jesse kind of reappears, he, it shakes her world. So it's kind of figuring, she had to figure out who she wanted to be in order to pick, uh, if she wanted to pick up her marriage again, or if she wanted to continue on with the life that she had now. Um, and so because of that struggle with her, I couldn't necessarily say who I wanted her to be with. But if I was in her shoes, always Team Sam. Yeah, I feel like I'm not far enough in the book to make a decision. But um, from where I'm at so far, I would say Team Sam. Um, because it feels like a less superficial relationship. Like I feel like she know like even 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 as kids she she knows them a little deeper and a little more like they're friends first whereas jesse is more like feels like more of a fantasy and i think so as a teenager i think you know 15 year old maureen would have been all about team jesse but i feel like as an adult team team sam because he seems um it seems like a more um uh a relationship built on common interests and shared um uh, shared um uh, just interests, I guess. Yeah. Um, so I am team Sam, I would say, uh, team, I would, I would have been team Jesse in my twenties. Cause I would have wanted to be with someone. Oh yeah. Let's travel. Let's, um, do this. Let's do that. Um, just very, uh, fast paced. Um, rather now I want to just stay at home and, sleep <laughs> and after our work I don't feel like traveling I don't mind to travel every now and again um but yeah I would rather me personally I just want to be with somebody who just would rather stay at home and chill let's relax um so but I was like Anna to where uh, I, yeah she needed to discover who she wanted to be before she could decide what to be to choose between the two um and i think yeah she made a very good <laughs> decision that was best for her so i'm happy for her that she made sure to you know do what was best for her um at the end so it was um yeah i think she made a pretty good and wise decision um I think like I, because I'm married to my high school sweetheart and stuff, like that part of me is like, was like dying for her to be team Jesse, you know, because I'm like, that's like the person, like you went to high school with him. You went to college with him. You guys built a life together before that. Like you spent like, t like, you know, like a huge chunk of your life together. And, um, so I think about that. And like, you know, like I've been with my husband longer than like my dad was alive in my life, 
you know. Um, so I like it's always like that part of me is like, oh my gosh, she has to be Team Jesse. But I'm not sure that she and Jesse would have made it anyway because she was already starting to change what she wanted mm. a little bit, like right when he leaves on that trip. And I mean, like, bro goes on a trip on their one year anniversary. Like, that's not cool. Okay. So I just like, didn't, I don't know if they would have made it all the way anyway. Um, so that part of me thinks that for her in the character, in the story, that Sam is the best choice. Yeah, I'm going to repeat probably a lot of what Jane just said. When I went into it originally, because I'm married, I was like, I would be devastated if I lost my husband like that. And I would like cling to him forever. So she has to choose him. And by the end of the story, I was like, she could not have chosen anybody but Sam because that was what was right for her. And I think that's why like, I liked it so much is because she managed to change my mind um, on that. Um, but reading it the second time, I was like, how did I want her to end up with Jesse? Like that was, that would have been totally wrong. And like the whole book, I was like, Sam is the best. Um, and like, I, I liked him as like a choice for me. I would have picked him. Um, and so I think, yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on which time you're talking about, but I think for the character, um, I definitely think Sam was the best choice. All right. I love this next question. One true love challenges the idea that a person can only have one true love that is super prominent in books and movies. Do you think that a person can only have one once in a lifetime love, or do you think it's possible to have more than one soulmate? So of course I did not get a chance to read this month, but I have a lot of thoughts on this. I think it is really problematic in our culture that there is this narrative largely to books and movies because it's a wonderful literary device that, you know, there is this idea that you have like one soulmate that you're destined to meet on this, um, you know, in, in our lifetime. And I do a hundred percent believe that there are people we are destined to meet in life, you know, uh, platonic friends, people that, of course, that, that we've dated that it didn't work out with. And of course, like, I feel like I was destined to meet all of you guys, right? Like we, a lot of us have found this community and it's brought us so much life and, and has changed us for the better. And um, so I appreciate all of you who co-create Paper and Glam with me uh, because I feel that way uh, about you guys. So um, yeah, so I guess my answer is that I do believe, you know, as a Christian, Psalm 139, right? God has our lives planned out from the day we were born. Every, it says, the Psalm says, every day of your life was planned out before you were born, right? But I also think we have free will and sometimes things don't work out and God always has a backup plan. So I don't believe in the existential crisis that like romantic love can sometimes deal out in that like, if you, if you, something doesn't work out, like you miss the life you were intended to live. Like I totally don't buy that at all. I think when people walk out of our lives for whatever reason, um, so all is grace. So uh, those are my thoughts on that trope. I love that we can discuss kind of literary tropes and just, you know, this, and the same ones, of course, right, play out in movies. It doesn't matter kind of what storytelling medium we're in. I love that we can talk about these uh, at, at like a global level because most books do follow like very, like, like a handful of tropes. It, it's like they're all, you know, there. So uh, yeah, what did you think, Anna? Or what is your opinion? I definitely kind of on the same boat. Um, I don't really believe that it's possible to have more than one soulmate because of course God has that ultimate soulmate for us. But I also know with free will that can complicate things. Um, so I think, but I do think that every love that we have is a once in a lifetime love because we're not always the same person that we were yesterday or 10 years ago. Um, and not every love will stand the test of time. So that's kind of my thoughts. What about you, Maureen? Yeah, um, first of all, that, that was really sweet what you said, Lisa Marie, about, um, I feel the same way, like it's, I, I think the older I get, the, the more I realize that the, 
the women in my life are are like the great loves of my life it's so um just very sweet um but i also i was just listening to a or watching a youtube video right before we got together tonight and it was talking about how love is a skill and I, I really like that idea. Like it's not a feeling, it's a, it's an action that we work on. And so I think with that in mind, I think it's totally possible to have more than one great love in your life, depending on your circumstances and your choices. Um, because I think it's, I, I, I do believe that it's something that, um, like uh, followed up by the, the long, long-term married ladies, I'm sure will, will attest that, you know, it's, it's work to, to have a really, like, no matter how, um, how much of a spark there was in the beginning, I think to maintain that is, is, um, it takes, it takes a lot out of both people. And I think that's, um, sometimes I think people don't give themselves enough credit for, for that aspect of love. So I think it's totally possible. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that people should have more than one love in their life, just that it's possible. Yeah, so um, this question, it made me think of um, the Sex in the City episode. I wish I could remember what season it was, but it's um, forget who Carrie is dating and she's meeting with Samantha and um, them and she's like, what if we're each other's soulmates? And <laughs> that's what I um, I always think of like my, my um, core group of friends, like maybe they're <laughs> my soulmates um because i can't me personally i've probably only been in love oof, once <laughs> um, and so um yeah i definitely think it's possible to have um different loves um and i also think uh that you can also have different types of soulmates it doesn't just have to be just one um per one like real how, not relationship but it's a, it's not like the typical i'm basically saying it doesn't have to be the typical soulmate your best friends can be uh your soulmates for sure so um so i oddly don't necessarily subscribe to the idea of soulmates which like um i had a friend who was very surprised because my husband and i have been together like almost 22 years but, and so she was like, what do you mean you don't believe in soulmates? Like you don't, and I, but I don't, because I feel like the idea of soulmates negates um, the idea of the work like Maureen was talking about that of, of like having to work at that love for that love. And so I kind of feel like more like that free will aspect of it, that whoever you choose to form your life with, that that person becomes your soulmate, but not that you, you know, not that like. Because I think that what happens that this idea of soulmates in our society has become almost dangerous in a way, because then when that like limerence feeling of like, oh, we're so in love, everything's going great goes away. People think like, oh, well, that person must not have been my soulmate. Let me hop on to the next person. And so I kind of think that the way that it's portrayed in media is not exactly what it really is supposed to be. Um, so because of that and because of the work that is part of it, like if your spouse is to leave or for whatever reason you aren't together anymore, um, I think of course you can go through and become soulmates and become attached and, you know, in the same way. Um, I know for me, I probably wouldn't be interested in like finding love again if my husband were to die. But I think that's also something that was modeled to be my modeled for me by my grandmothers. They were both widows and neither of them went looking for love again. Um, they just were perfectly content. And my one grandmother was widowed at like age 36. So she was like, you know, around my age and she, she just lived her life like as a strong, took care of herself woman. And so I think that I, I don't know if I, you know, and she just always loved my grandpa and that, and that was it. So I think that I would like to do that for my family if that were to happen to Dave. Yeah, I think um, even more than um, love triangles, I hate the idea of soulmates in books, especially when it's like, um, uh, like we have this bond that once we found each other, we were like formed from the beginning, like um, that. Marissa Tomei movie, Only You, she's talking about at the beginning where like, uh, I think it was like 
the Greeks believe that your soul was split in two and put into two different people. And like, like that idea of a soulmate, I, I don't believe in at all. I don't think we have one soulmate. I think we have a lot of people who we could be soulmates with. Um, and the, uh, like Jane was saying, like what makes you soulmates is choosing to be with that person and work, you know, the rest of your life or however long it is that you're together. Um, cause some people are, uh, they, they don't ever get married with like, it's just somebody that like understands them deeply. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely am not a fan of the like, one single soulmate thing out um and like it's always been one of those things that whenever I come across it I'm like no 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 I don't like this can we like change the story a little bit yeah it's so interesting I love that you guys brought out the reality that love is a choice right even that's something I've been thinking a lot about with respect to career right even when we're talking about love even with you know paper and glam which is 100 thousand percent my calling for this lifetime which you know at the whole is to be a conduit of God's grace and to create really beautiful safe nurturing spaces whether that's within my home and inviting you guys into it whether that's this book club whether that's our bible study that at its core is is my mission and you know that's that's what i want to do with myself in my life but it's like love is such a choice right like whether we're talking about a relationship whether we're talking about work like we don't always feel it and there's a you better work sticker from back in the day that's you know still in the shop that says not much gets done if you only work when you feel like it and it's similar with it's the same with romantic love right or any type of love it's like I mean even if you love a fur baby right like sometimes they are a handful Sunday's right next to me and she's being a handful right now because she wants to be on camera and to see you guys so that's something I think about uh, a lot and have been thinking about um, in the last season and Venus was in retrograde. So Venus is all the things we love, whether that's our home, whether that's our work, whether that's all the people in our lives. So it's definitely given me a lot of thought um, and reflecting on uh, the fact that love is a choice. So that I love that you guys brought out. And then also, um, Erica, you touched on this, but so the idea of soulmates is that there are people you are destined to meet that like you knew in a past life. And the theory is that, you know, you knew each other in a past life and found each other in this life, um, which sounds really romantic, but can also be like, would be really triggering, right? Um, because you knew them in a past life. So there's like all that other past life stuff. And then there's the idea of twin flames, which is like a level above soulmate. And, um, and I don't know that I subscribe to any of this, but since it's part of the question, I thought I'd share what, you know, what the theories are. So the theory is that if you have a twin flame and not everyone gets a soulmate and not everyone gets a twin flame, um, as this narrative goes, and a twin flame means what Erica was saying, that you, that two people were split, um, and then came and came as two diff different people and they are meant to be completed in each other. So from a Christian perspective, uh, of course, I, I think we're all complete and perfect when we come to earth and God is you know, the one that completes us. Uh, but um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where I fall on all of that, but I think it's all very interesting theories and I love talking about the human experience and all its forms and, and narratives and tropes. So uh, next question. Throughout the book, there's an underlying theme of identity and figuring out who you are. As a teen and young adult, Emma rebels against being the bookseller's daughter, but as a 30-something embraces that role wholeheartedly until Jesse returns. Have you had similar experiences with your own identity? Oh, another question I love as an Enneagram 4 who, you know, our Enneagram 4s always love like this idea of becoming ourselves and uh, kind of like transformation and birthing ourselves into, um, you know, more evolved versions of ourselves. So I'm excited to hear what you guys think. What do you think, Anna? Yeah, I, I can relate to this on a little bit of a level. Um, when I was in, even though I've always been a reader, I actually never thought I would fall into the library field until I was like, I don't know, 65. Um, because that's kind of where I, how it was where I grew up. You didn't go to become a library. You just kind of became one because you needed to fill your retirement hours. Um, 
so it never like crossed my mind to go and be a librarian or a teacher um so i was t i completely went to school for a biology degree actually is where i started in order to become an animal rehabilitation uh veterinarian type field um i really wanted to take animals that had been abused and be able to rehabilitate them so that way they could go on to find their forever homes um and in college i was i realized that i was kind of just kidding myself a little bit um and that god had a better idea knew exactly who i was and who i needed to be and brought me back into the reading life and the library field and made it actually possible for me to become who I am now. And I couldn't be more grateful. Yeah, this question really, um, uh, really spoke to me in that um, I think from the time I was like four years old, everyone always said, oh, Maureen's going to be a teacher, Maureen's going to be a teacher. And I was a teacher, like a, I taught high school for, for seven years. And I, while I loved it, um, I always had a lot of defiance about it. Like I, came, I went into it late and I spent a lot of my career also working in professional theater. Um, and that's what, where I'm working now. And my mom still will say to me, but you're still a teacher. And, and I, there's this weird defiance because I know deep down she's right and that really what what drives me Lisa Marie when you were talking about the twin flames for me I think it's working with children and working with young people like that is something that no matter how far I try and get away from being a traditional classroom teacher I can't like I just really there's something I, I, I know it but it's so funny but I think because everyone told me from the time I was a kid that that's what you're going to be there's this weird defiance that it's like no I'm not going to let anyone else define me and I'm not a teacher and I left the classroom it's not who I am and yet um, I have not spent a day of my life where young people aren't at the center of what I do and that and that like a lot of even like my conflict at work sometimes is that I'm the advocate for the kids like I'm often like it doesn't matter like the kids aren't gonna understand that and we have to, like and I just I can't stop fighting that fight but it's it's weird how stubborn I am about letting my mom be right about okay yeah um identity well i'm always trying to change my i don't i don't think i'm not gonna say i'm always trying to change my identity but i'm always looking to improve um myself personally um i can say i would never have thought um that when i got my master's six oh shoot hold on seven years ago oh my gosh seven years ago i got my master's in healthcare administration i thought i was going to be this big time hr person doing healthcare and trying to i don't know change the healthcare system ha huh. yeah right and look at me now <laughs> i am a buyer <laughs> for um an independent um bookstore so i um yeah, uh, back in my 20s, I probably would have been more set on a certain path. Um, but now, as I get older, I'm just willing to go with whatever um, floats my boat. I just go wherever God and the universe shall take me. And I'm just trying to stay open. And um, I used to get really angry about stuff. And now I'm trying to, okay just relax everything you know what everything will be okay so yeah i definitely um i could relate to her um a lot i would say um probably why i stay it kept my interest because she was um you know trying to she had built her life around jesse and then he left and she realized she needed to let him go because she thought she was dead um and move on and try to start a new life and um yeah, um, I could definitely um, relate to that. Yeah, like Maureen, I kind of always knew I would teach. Um, probably in late in high school and college, early college, I thought that I was going to own a dance studio and that's what I was going to teach. So teaching, but dance, but like as a kid, like at the end of the year, you know, like um, back in the day when I was a kid and we had dittos because you didn't have Xerox machines, you had ditto machines, 
like the leftover dittos my teachers would give them to me and then I would like have pretend school. So I'm not surprised at all that I'm, um, became a teacher. I kind of knew I'd always teach and inform people probably. Um, I don't think I knew that I would be so passionate about like, um, the community that I teach in now, when I got my degree, I thought for sure that we would stay in the area we grew up in, um, which is a upper middle class area. And I always was in AP classes and stuff. So I never thought I would teach like, I always thought I would be like an AP teacher and teach stuff like that. Um, and then we moved to um, a place we could afford because we were like 21 and buying a house. And um, it's a different demographic and it's a different community. And um, at first it was very odd and I felt like I was in the twilight zone and that wasn't so much because of the students, but it was because of the weird backwards adults I worked with who were super weird because they were kind of like, no one's watching us out here in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so we can do all this weird crap. Um, but I decided, you know, I came to love like my like rougher students um, who have like gang life and history and, you know, stuff like that. And um, as much as I love, you know, my, I love that I can teach my Shakespeare class, but like who typically takes it is not like, they're not AP kids who take my Shakespeare class. It's kids who you're like, that kid's taking Shakespeare class. And so they're not there for the Shakespeare. They're there because they took a different class with me and they like me and they know that I can help them figure out how to learn and pass and get information. And so I like that aspect um, of my job. And I think I always knew that was, would be who I was. I was always really secure in who I was and who I thought I wanted to be. And I think that's why when I was really young before I met my husband and I know like I say really young, I met him when I was 16, but, um, like I was ready to like date like before that. And, um, but I didn't want to, and all my friends had boyfriends all the time and they would like, you know, have a new boyfriend like every month. And I was like, all the girls, they all have boyfriends, all the boys like them. No one likes me, but I wouldn't have liked any of those boys anyway, because anytime I did date a boy, I, I would tell them. Like, oh, we have to break up. Like, like I, I can tell I won't marry you, you know? Like, so I, I always was secure in who I was. I think the only time in my life I felt really like kind of untethered was about the time I started Paper and Glam. Um, and it was like one of the things that like kind of brought me, you know, like kind of back into focus. And it's, I, like, I was having a lot of difficulty. Like I had lost some friendships. Um, I, I don't, you know, like my kids were at an age where they were starting to go to school, like preschool and stuff. Um, my other friends were going back to work from being stay at home mommies, you know, like, like everything was changing. And so I just kind of felt like really alone and like, didn't know what was going on and stuff. And so, um, I think that was kind of it. Um, but other than that, I, I've kind of always known who I was. So you know, like the idea of like finding yourself or rebelling against your parents. Um, I don't know. That's not something I've really struggled with. Yeah, I didn't ever really have like this, I'm not going to be who my parents want me to be rebel type um, part of my life. But um, something that I did think about when I was reading the book is uh, there's a line in there uh, where she was like, you know, um, my life was divided into before and after. I thought it was before, um, or like before Jesse's accident and after, and I'm realizing now that it's, you know, before he came home and after he came home. Um, but I was thinking about how my life, I kind of divided into this before and after, um, because there was like the experience of my husband and I lived um, overseas for, almost a year. Um, and it like changed everything about how we saw the world, um, and our place in it and everything and like changed how we viewed pretty much every single thing that we think about. Um, and so, uh, that there was like that pivotal moment of like changing your identity. And I think about how, um, like when you have a moment like that, you're not the same person that you were before it. And so going back to the earlier question, like I don't think 
that um, she could have been with Jesse because like she figures out like she's a totally different person. Like her identity is, she's, is completely new because she's had this experience and he did too. But um, I just, I like to think about um, like those experiences that um, are those moments where um, it completely changes basically like everything about how you see everything around you. Right. I love a good coming of age novel. Um, I think it's interesting what Maureen said, like I always knew I was going to be a teacher as well, but I knew I wasn't going to be an in classroom teacher. I would pretend and be teacher. Um, I would pretend and play store, you know, so I always knew my calling would be something to do with ideas and truth. Um, that's where I've always made my home. I think as an only child with workaholic parents, I developed a very rich inner life very early. And I would definitely say this answers the next question as well. Uh, I was destined to be a reader and, you know, to talk about it astrologically, I'm a Gemini sun and a Pisces rising. So that's like the two signs that just are about ideas and wisdom. So um, books were my destiny and teaching was also my destiny, but you know, to an extent, like we're all teachers, right? Like whether we're parents, whether we're mentors, whether we're sisters, you know, as, as women and, and as humans, we're all, we're all teaching. And even that, if that's just modeling by example and modeling um, in the way that we live our lives and the way that we treat others and the way that we, um, you know, build community and build, build nurturing spaces around us. So, um, great segue into the, our last question, question which is, um, okay, so on this next one, we're going to choose our own adventure. So this is two questions, but we're going to pair them together. So I just answered this next one, which is throughout the book, Emma transitions from being an avid non-reader to enjoying books and becoming her family's bookstore owner. How did you become a reader? And if you were a reluctant reader as a child, any advice for non-readers or parents of reluctant readers? Second part of the question, part two, or choose one or the other book chatters, and those of you watching live, one true loves raises the eternal, if you had to do it all over again dilemma, why do these narratives so frequently begin in high school? Do you find you are inclined to begin your story from the point of your of you, of your teenage self. I absolutely find that to be true. Um, they say psychologically that our most impressionable time is 17. And that's absolutely true. The things and the people that we love at that age shape us. And everything that I loved at 17 is present in the brand of Paper and Glam. And I find that to be really, really fascinating and interesting. Um, in some ways, and Jaina and I have talked a lot about this because she teaches high school and that age group is, in some ways I feel like I was wiser and more rooted at 17 than I am now because as you get older, you kind of have so much more experience and like the world kind of has its way with you a little more and you almost get like more indoctrinated in the world's view as opposed to like your idealized, very like uh, raw self. So that's something I think about a lot is, um, you know, that original like person that was inspired to to jump, you know, to jump into to who I am now. And um, as, as COVID has, you know, changed the world and changed me and changed my business, um, I'm really in a season of like getting back to basics and getting back to kind of that elemental version of myself. So yeah, I definitely just love this question and related to it um, so deeply. All right, uh, Miss Anna, choose your own adventure from, from those two questions. Uh, so for me, I'm going to go with the first question. Um, I'm very grateful to have always been a reader. I don't know if my signs are what just in that, or if it's just a matter of the fact that like my grandfather's a reader. Um, my mom was a reader before I was born. Um, so I've just always been surrounded by books and I grown up in a small town. There really wasn't like being able to go out and do things. You went to the library to the programs that they had. Um, so I've always been a reader. 
And while I've never really been a reluctant reader, I know a lot of reluctant readers. Um, and especially working in a library, I get the question all the time. It's like, my kid doesn't like to read. What do I do? Um, so I say if you're a reluctant reader or if you are the parent of a reluctant reader, find something that interests you or your child and just start there. It's like even if they stare at it for 15 minutes before they actually pick it up, like try and build that habit of getting them to read. Um, and then if they grow up to not be readers, that's okay. But as long as they can understand why reading is important, um, I'd say that's a success. Um, and also audiobooks and graphic novels are really re real reading and no one can tell me otherwise. So let them read how they, how they can learn how to read. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with the second one, uh, the, if you had to do it all over again, I would say I always, um, reference from high school whenever I had these kinds of thoughts. Um, but then, uh, in my adulthood, I had a, a, a pretty severe pivot, um, uh, about 10 years ago. And I find that since that point, that's become the point of like reference that I go back to. Like, it's almost like, I feel like the person before that, that point is, is a different Maureen and and that that story has been like resolved and like dealt with um, which I know isn't true and that like every once in a while something will will happen and I'll be like oh yeah I have to go all the way back to high school to really make sense of that thing but usually my pivot point has become the new um the new point of reference for like oh maybe I shouldn't have done that maybe I should maybe I should think about where that's putting me and like maybe I need to um yeah, so that 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 pivot point I think was so significant that that it kind of changed that that arc for me. Um, which, yeah, I don't know what that's all about. It's the first time I've really thought about it. Okay, I'm going to answer um, the first question about um, reading, and then I'm also there was an optional question, and I really have two good recommendations. <laughs> um, so, but first, um, I've always um, been a reader. I would say in college, I um, didn't read as much because I was um, on the tennis team, and I was um, juggling tennis in school was a lot. So I, I pretty much started getting back into it after I graduated. And I would recommend for parents who have reluctant readers, like Anna said, find something that interests um, them. Like a lot of the TV series for kids on Netflix, especially, are based off of um, graphic novels. So, and I can't stand when people say graphic novels isn't reading. I want them to re get them started on something. Um, the Dogman series is really good for um, elementary school kids. And the Phoebe and the Unicorn, um, for the good girls, um, and then Trapped in a Video Game, and The Last Kids on Earth, very popular, um, series that are on Netflix that, um, start, that are part of graphic novels, and, um, if you enjoyed One True Love or are looking for a beach time read, um, I have, my first recommendation would be Beach Read. It's not a love triangle, but, um, it's by Emily Henry, and it's like one of like the best books, romance books I've read this year. Um, and it's about a writer named January whose father just passed away, and she inherits his lake house. And her neighbor is this guy from college, like her arch nemesis writer from college. She writes romance novels. He writes heavy fiction. They both have to write books, so they decide they're going to write each other's genre. And so they, she takes him on romantic dates and he takes her to like heavy, you know, they do meet with people who've gone through traumatic things. So good, so good. Um, and then um, something a little bit more along the lines of um, One True Loves is um, Paris is Always a Good Idea uh, by Jen McKinley. And that's about this character who's, mom has passed away and her dad has moved on and is marrying somebody so she decides she realized she's trapped in this world um and she needs to move on so but she needs to settle something so she goes to all these different countries where um 
I forget, I think it like France, Ireland, and somewhere else where she kind of settles and um, try to settle relationships that were didn't end on the right note. So um, I haven't read that one, but I've heard really good things about that. And it's probably on the lines of um, uh, One True Love, if you like the finding yourself type of thing. Um, I think I'm going to focus on that first question about reading because um, the kind of the doing it all over again. The only thing I think I would do all over again is if I had known my dad was going to die when I was 14, I would have spent more time with him because um, my parents were divorced and he was disabled and, you know, so, and he, he was just like a super like old school guys guy. So he just like built wood stuff and like mowed the lawn and like we didn't really have like a strong relationship because what does a little girl do with that <laughs> you know um and he was disabled so he would get really tired and he couldn't like hang out with us so as far as reading then um i've always liked to read my mom read all the time she read like every danielle still still novel She's read like every Nora Roberts novel. She used to read the V.C. Andrews novels when I was a little girl. And I loved how there was the little picture and you could poke it. And then like the people were behind it. And like, I was like, I want to read big girl books like my mom. Um, and so I love to read, but I wouldn't necessarily always do it because I also, I loved to dance more. So I spent almost all my time just like, dancing and choreo choreographing and watching things about dance and and or drawing like fashion pictures um because I like to do that too because I really like fashion a lot um ever since I was a little girl and so I always read but just kind of like here and there and I always bought books with the intention of reading them I still have books from high school I bought with the intention of reading and someday I will so I keep them um there's not like a lot, but you know, just stuff I, I would keep. And I think that it has to do with time and splitting your, um, you know, if you love multiple things, especially when you're young and I had a lot more friends when you're young, cause you do a lot of stuff with your friends in like high school. And so you're out all the time. So you don't have time to read. Um, at least, you know, like it was not unheard of for us to have like a party midweek that we went to because like that's how my friends were. Um, so we were just out doing that and I would do my homework and stuff and I didn't really have time to read for pleasure until um, I would say during college when I was getting my literature degree, I didn't start out as a lit major. I actually started out as a communications major um, because I wanted to be an entrepreneur <laughs> and, and that was gonna be my job and then um, during ballet class, um, a classmate told me that he was an English major and I was like, oh, like, is that hard? And he was like, oh yeah, it's really hard. Like you probably couldn't do it. And then I was like, oh yeah, challenge accepted. And so I switched my major because I wanted to teach speech and debate. And in California to teach speech and debate, you have to have an English degree. And that was why I had inquired about how it was going for him getting an English degree. Um, and oddly, that's why I wanted to get my English degree and I've still never taught speech and debate. <laughs> um, I'm going to be like Dean and answer the question about reading and then give some recommendations. Um, I know that when I was little, I read a lot. Um, like I was like my kids where we would go to the library and I'd get a stack of books. And like the next day I was like, can we go back to the library? Cause I had already finished them. Um, but then I stopped reading and I was obsessed with TV and movies, like from elementary school all the way through high school. Um, it, like so much that my parents were like, you have got to stop watching stuff. And I like, it was still just that like story. And I was like obsessed with how they were telling stories. Um, and it was just easier to watch them um, than spend, you know, five hours reading the book. Um, and so that's what I would do because I didn't have a lot of free time. Um, but then it was in college, like Jaina, I was an English major and I was reading for fun and instead of, instead of reading um, 
like what I was supposed to be reading for class. Like I would read the, I would read the minimum amount that I had to for class because I would rather be reading my other stuff. Um, and so that's, but that's really when I started rereading or started reading again was um, in college. Um, and then uh, for recommendations, there were two books that I thought of when I was reading this. Um, the first is um, Goodbye for Now by Lori Frankel. Um, and it is about, it's kind of sci-fi-ish, but not really. Um, it's about these people that come up with a way to talk with your uh, loved ones who have died. And it deals with that, um, like, uh, can you really love somebody if you only love a past version of them? Um, and then the other one is also by Taylor Jenkins Reid. It's maybe in another life and it has a lot to do with soulmates and like, what if you choose this person over this person? Um, and I think those are the two that I thought of. All right, I was just writing those recommendations uh, down so that I could get you guys links for all of those. The optional question that <laughs> our book chatters are referencing are is a question we almost always end book club with, and that is what should our readers read next if they enjoyed One True Loves? We always want to get you guys more things on your TBR. Part of, well, part of the main joy of being in a book club is that the idea is to pick up books we wouldn't otherwise pick up and potentially love books we wouldn't have otherwise loved if we hadn't talked about them and read them in the context of community. Because here at Paper and Glam, we believe that everything is better together and um, all of the things we love are better together. So, um, Taylor Drinkins Reed is an author that's really beloved by our community. Specifically, the read that comes up is The Seven Husbands of Elizabeth Hugo, and that's one that our readers mention a lot. And then also Daisy Jones and the Six is, is a big one. That's been such a big uh, read since Reese picked it as her book club read. Um, both of those books are also getting movie adaptations, so that's also uh, really fun. And um, Taylor Jenkins Reed has a really beautiful love story with her husband, and um, yeah, so that the trope of like soulmates and what happens if you lose one is really, really uh, worked through in almost all of her books. And it's also in her first book, um, which is called uh, Forever Interrupted. So, um, so yeah, that's that. And in housekeeping, we will be reading a very Glamericana book next. And this was recommended by Book Chatter. Emily Patterson, who couldn't make it tonight for work, and it's called American Royals. So this is a smash hit. It's uh, it's it's like uh, if The Crown took place in America plus Gossip Girl. So all things I love, Gossip Girl plus The Crown in a book. I mean, here for it, right? So another light one, as we all need lighter reads, I think uh, during the summer. And this book is such a runaway success. The sequel American Royals 2 which is called Majesty is already open for pre-order it comes out in November so that's really fun and all of the links are all down below um, if you shop through any of the links Paper and Glam gets a very small percentage of the sale which we so appreciate uh, your support for uh, reading together and co-creating this universe with me and then our next meeting is July 30th all things Paper and Glam that are live events take place at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. So we will be discussing American Royals right here, same time, same place, same time, same place for the last six years, uh, 6 p.m. Pacific, American Royals. Our Patreon live stream is the week before, July 23rd. We'll be going to spreadsheet school. I'll be teaching um, how to make an amazing TBR. And hopefully I haven't asked Anna, but she did one last time. And I know a lot of us have follow-up questions. And if you have a beautiful TBR spreadsheet, we would love to see how you track your reading. Another member of our uh, community, Keely, is going to be sharing a really beautiful reading journal by the no called The Novel Companion. So everything for the next Patreon live stream is all tracking the reading life. And if you're like me, and that's kind of all you've done this summer from a reading perspective, uh, you're going to really not want to miss this one because... For me, in the reading life, half the fun as a planner of, of reading is planning what I'm going to read and anticipating what I'm going to read. And reading is a lot like dating, right? Like 
for every book you choose, you're choosing no to another book, right? Because we all cannot read all of the books. So choosing what to read is kind of a big deal because I really believe we're all a product of the people we meet and the books we read. And I feel like Taylor Jenkins Weed, Reed would agree. And I definitely believe some books are destined to find us. So I don't know if you've ever had the experience where a book literally falls off your bookshelf and you just know you're supposed to read that book. That happens to me all the time. All right. Uh, I think that's a wrap for tonight. Please remember to give this video a thumbs up, readers. Share it with a friend. Share what we do here at Paper and Glam uh, with a friend. And come support it uh, on Patreon. I will see you um, the third Thursday and the fourth Thursday of every month. Until next time, sweet readers. Happy reading.